friend Adam Bartley, and we're here to welcome you to the final performance of the world premiere production of Visible Language by Mary Reesing and Andy Welch. This has been an extraordinary experience for all of us. Um, it has been, it would never have been possible without the collaboration, the co-production between my company, Avant Bard, and the Gallaudet University Theater and Dance Program. We want to thank them for being our hosts, for being our collaborators, for all the incredible work that they've done to make this possible. Uh, we're very proud and pleased uh, to have been their partner on this production. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, this uh, performance will be followed immediately afterwards by a post-show discussion. This unscripted after chat uh, will start, uh, as I say, about a minute after the show comes down. So please join us for that. I also wanted to mention that some of the equipment you see in the house <laughs> out here is because this performance is being live streamed broadcast on the web all across the globe uh, by HowlRound, the national uh, theater networking site and the blog, uh, they call themselves the Theater Commons. Uh, we're very grateful to them uh, and uh, we're very grateful to you all for being here to help us uh, do this show right and broadcast it all around, around the globe. Uh, so thank you very much to them and to you for being here. I wanted to, uh, again, uh, I wanted to encourage you to turn off your cell phones, please, at this point. And I apologize to the people who I'm going to inconvenience in just a moment when I walk across to get to my place uh, for the show so I can monitor things. But again, thank you so much for coming and enjoy the show. Years, 
The National College for the Deaf at Kendall Green has grown enormously. In 1857, when I, Edward Minor Gallaudet, became director, we were a school for five desperately poor deaf children, housed in a shack. I thought that my father's dream that every deaf child receive an education could never come true. Honorable gentlemen, I, Alexander Graham Bell, have daily experience in my own home of the value of teaching the deaf to speak. Because she has learned to articulate correctly, my dear wife, Mabel Cumberbell, easily passes for hearing. Using my father's visible speech system, I myself taught her to speak. Inclusion, isolation, cooperation, separation, translation, interpretation, education, articulation. to embrace another child. Now is the time to seize the leadership role in deaf education. Now is the time to create a new generation of American educators, American teachers of the deaf, and lift our deaf out of their ignorance. The deaf must be educated.
Let me help you. So, we're here, but I'm not quite sure what, um, I can't quite see. a lot of resources into our oral program. Oh, well, Minor, you know I've always agreed with you that every our students should learn to speak if they can. Truly. Uh, you know, I find that difficult to fathom. After all, your mother, God rest her soul, never learned to speak. 
If that was her choice, not mine. Oh, you misunderstand as always. It's just that articulation instruction is expensive. We must be practical. The college has very few resources. Oh, your offer flatters me, old man. But no, no, I don't think so. My health, my headaches. I've spoken with General Coxman. Do you know him? A fine man and a member of the U.S. House of Representatives and a strong voice on our board of directors. He thinks that with a little work, the U.S. Congress could be persuaded to increase our subsidy. Now you can count on me for a donation, of course. We'd rather have you. Oh, well, perhaps just one lecture. Oh, Enel, Enel's my lad. Oh, please, please. Oh. Ah, congratulations on your honors degree. Quite admirable. Ah, well, I'm sure that you have a brilliant future ahead of you. The, have you settled on a profession? Ah. ah, well, teaching the classics, the old Odyssey and Aeneas. Ah, you don't <laughs> lack for ambition, do you? Well, good luck, lad. Eggles is one of Kendall Green's most promising young men. Ah, yes. He yes. has what it takes to become a great scholar and a teacher. Mm. I have high hopes for him. <laughs> <clears throat> it is such a shame that he does not speak. If he did, he could teach at a first-class institution. Now I suppose he must resign himself to a post at a Deaf school in the hinterlands. Hey, Mr. Carlotter! Hey, Mr. Carlotter! My carriage. Mm. Uh, that reminds me, Miner, uh, before you go, there's a rumor afoot. Is it true that you are thinking of starting a teacher's college at Kendall Green? Yes, I'm, I think it's time that we uh, increase the number of truly skilled teachers of the deaf. It's a most urgent need, as I'm sure you'll all be agree. Oh, who would argue? So you will be training your deaf students to become teachers of the deaf. No, no deaf students will be admitted to the teacher's college. That would kill our oral program. Deaf teachers cannot teach articulation. Ah, uh, good thought, Ah, uh, Mike, I forgot. Please do come to our next Wednesday evening soiree. Mrs. Bell would be quite cross with me if I neglected to ask you. The little deaf blind girl, Helen Keller, will be there. Truly, well, I've been reading those letters of hers that you had published in the newspaper. Ah, she's quite the charm. Oh, well, she's really the most wonderful thing. The fellas from the Geographic Society are going to quiz her. It should be very interesting stuff. Such a fascinating case. Well, I will check my schedule, Alec, and it is a most intriguing case, especially for an oralist such as yourself. No deaf blind child has ever been taught to speak. Without sight or hearing, signs are the only possible method of communication. Minor, I, I just decided it. I'm going to use my father's visible speech system to teach Helen Keller to speak. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. You are going to teach a deaf child who is blind to speak. Well, that is amusing. You have been away from the field of deaf communication far too long. You don't think I can do it? Honestly. Honestly. Well, no, I do not think you will succeed. You are a good teacher, but no, no. <laughs> How little you know me. I'm not only that good, I will teach her to speak by next Wednesday, and not just articulation, but articulation, modulation, and rhythm. <laughs> in, fact, in, fact, in fact, I will have her demonstrate her speech to the Geographic Society on Wednesday. Yes. Well, that's only nine days away. Yes. Oh, well, this time we'll have to see the great Dr. Bell embarrassed. <laughs> 
Please tell Mrs. Bell to add me to the top of the list of attendees. <laughs> well, do please bring your lovely wife. We see her so rarely. One would think you weren't married at all. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint, but Mrs. Gallaudet is tucked away in Hartford. She's with the children in our summer home. The Washington Beach, you know. And also come to Ah. Well, I really must be going, and I imagine you need to get busy right away. So much to do. Always. But that's the cost of progress. And we must all do our part to move the world forward. The stapler, the postage stamp, antiseptics. The safety pin, the telegraph, the elevator, the internal combustion engine. The machine gun, dynamite, the telephone, the phonograph, the fountain pen, toys and airs, paper, and your erasure. The coffee pot, the dishwasher, the sewing machine. The typewriter, radar, contact lenses, electromagnetic induction, matches, and parade, baby formula, potato chips, basketball, Christmas light, the refrigerator, mail car. The sensory of the sensory of the great lady, the highway. Our world is making free of breaking from one moment to another. Ah. 1817, our father brings sign language to America. 1819, our father teaches his dead wife to sign. 1864, my father invents the visible feet. I teach my deaf wife to speak. 1857. I turn 20, take over 20, go on the deck. 1876. I invent the telephone. 1864. President Lincoln makes me president of a car. 1878. I mean, I'm a millionaire. I'm a A century of progress, anything can happen. Our world is changing, rearranging from one moment to another. I learned to lobby Congress. I am in Queen Victoria. I found the gorgeous new campus. I found the National Geographic Society. I'm Tyler Merritt, my eighth child. Oh my, you're your wife. It's a century of innovation, a century of progress, anything can happen. Our world is changing, rearranging, this world is changing, this we are in people. Dr. Bell did tell you that we 
we were coming. Oh, yes, of course. But tomorrow, Alan Hunter got Letty confused. Uh, you weren't expecting us until tomorrow? How embarrassing! Oh, wow. I am truly not sorry. Um, well, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with my language. Well, I'm not. Uh, I'm sure that Dr. Bell told me you were deaf. I don't sign. Oh, my father insisted I speak properly. Oh, um, she would like to feel your face with her fingers to see you. Do you mind terribly? Oh, no, of course not. Um, Oh, um, <laughs> she finds you beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, little one. <laughs> uh, um, she is very impressed by your gown. Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, oh, she wants to know, is it from... Stern Brothers? So it, it oh, from, oh, no, work in Paris. Oh, oh, My yes. father was recently there on business and brought this back. Uh, Miss Sullivan, could I trouble you to face me when you speak? Oh, Helen, dear! <laughs> oh, 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 yes. oh. Oh, um, my dearest Dr. Bell, how glad I am to see you. Uh, but how did you know it was me? Oh, <laughs> boy, I could feel the stump, stump, stumping of your hair in the floorboard, and I could smell the lovely homemade you use in your Amazing. You discover parts of the world through your senses of smell and touch that the rest of us are completely blind. <laughs> Well, I guess. Oh, and Ellen, my, how you've grown. You are quite a little lady now. Soon the boys will be lining up outside your door with roses, fighting for the privilege of making you their little wife. But do promise me you will marry someone as brilliant as you are. It is the duty of gifted women to marry brilliant men and have gifted offspring. Of eugenics, you know. Oh, you will have lovely children. But I am sure that I will never find someone that I love as much as you and Papa. Ellen, your signing is vastly improved. Oh, and I have truly loved the letters in Braille you have sent me. How sweet your thoughts are. It means so much to me to have you communicate so clearly. Uh, I hope you didn't mind that I had your letters to be published in that New York paper. The, the press loves you so. Uh, well, <clears throat> Miss Dunway, the time has come to start working together on Helen's articulation. Oh! Oh, oh do you really think I could learn to speak to my sister, to my mother? To my dear little doggy, to the press. Of course you can. Why, when Mrs. Bell was about your age, she learned to speak in only a few months. Isn't that right, Mabel? I had a truly wonderful teacher. <laughs> oh, and I'm glad that you mentioned the press, Helen dear. A very special journalist has, con uh, has contacted me. Yes, she wishes to interview you. Yes, yes. Uh, have you ever heard of Laura Redding? Oh, uh, the famous. Death war correspondent! Oh, how marvelous! Yes, 
God, to be sure. Uh, perhaps you might meet with her tomorrow. Uh, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I would love to. Alan, my father's waiting for you. Is Mr. Searing a divorcee? Oh, ah. Uh, I don't think it's appropriate that an innocent young man. Ah, oh, divorcee nonsense. This is bell nonsense. Ah, uh, we mustn't judge it. She's a perfectly lovely woman. And a very influential journalist. Ah, and speaking of Helen's adoring public, I think we should do some sort of demonstration of Helen's speech for the Geographic Society next Wednesday evening. Several journalists will even be attending our little soiree. And Miss Sullivan? Well, that seems a little hasty. Oh, Helen's a smart girl. Good. Glad that settles. Shall we adjourn to the parlor? Oh, uh, uh, would either of you young ladies like to see a variation on famous spelling that Alice has done? It involves a specially made glove. Alec is always looking for new ways to educate the children. Oh, Mrs. Sell, how fascinating! <laughs> I am only too pleased to translate for such a use, an esteemed colleague and benefactor. The system of visible speech was invented by my father, A. Melville Bell, professor of vocal physiology. It constitutes a new system of phonetic writing, based not upon sounds themselves, but upon the actions of vocal organs in producing them. Visible speech is intended to produce accurate articulation by both the deaf and the hearing of every language known to man. Now, I want to make clear that visible speech takes no part in the contest between articulation on the one hand and signs and manual alphabets on the other. Rather, as my father, Melville Bell, has stated so clearly so many times, here, is a means by which one can produce perfect articulation from deaf use. Make use of it as you choose. Now, as you may know, the visible speech system is not necessarily associated with lip reading, but the symbols can materially assist deaf pupils by showing them what to look for in the mouths of hearing persons. Well, yes. So through this system, every deaf mute can learn to speak? That is our hope. So far, hundreds of deaf mutes have learned to speak using the system. Thank you. <laughs> How long would you say it takes to master this system? Well, it varies. Among the profoundly deaf, most students learn some words almost immediately, but full mastery can and should take several years. Uh, uh, articulation instruction should not be hurried. After all, a hearing child takes several years to learn to speak, and many more to speak correctly. Thank you. Would you say articulation is a five-year process? Five years is a good estimate. Five years, eh? That long. <clears throat> and only hearing teachers can teach articulation? That is correct. Now I have a start here. Uh, 
by now. Sign language is easier to acquire than speech. However, the beauty of this system is that once you put your mouth in the positions indicated by the signs, you cannot help but make the sound represented. All right, now look at the chart behind me. You will notice the outline of a face turned to the right has been drawn, and a representation of the inside of the mouth has now, as you can see, there are three fundamental positions of the tongue. One involves the back part of the tongue, the second involves the middle part of the tongue, and the third involves the front and back of the tongue. Uh, like so. Uh, back, middle, front and back. Now then, we combine <laughs> these tongue positions with three degrees of approach. High, mid, and low. Like so. <laughs> by slightly altering these sounds by rounding the lips, we then are able to make 18 distinguishable noises. With a few slight alterations to these 18 sounds, we can reproduce any sound in any language on the 18 continents. On, on the seven continents. <laughs> <laughs> French, we oui. Swahili, Dio. Anyway, oh, <laughs> E. And can this system be taught in a large classroom such as this? Well, as with most articulation methods, visible speech is best taught one on one. Currently, <clears throat> I am working one on one with Miss Helen Keller. Yes, yes. Well, and who could argue with money? Oh! <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bell. That was very enlightening. Students? And now I must show you the progress of our new dormitories. Ah, this way. I will expect written reports from each of you on Dr. Bell's presentation. Yes, please give them to Mr. Adams on Monday. Speed will connect you to the hearing world allow you to teach both deaf and hearing students, to explore your careers, better support your families, and become an agent of change. <laughs> I don't leave you. <laughs> very, humorous. very humorous indeed. But we all have things to say, and I, for one, believe the world needs to hear them.
gentle puff of breath. Puff, puff, like so. Puff, puff, puff. Now you try. <laughs> good, good. Now uh, once more.
Helen! 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 This is no time! Oh! Mrs. Searing! Um, it is so nice to meet you. Um, I am sorry that we are late. A trump. Um. <laughs> I prefer to communicate through writing. Oh, yes, well, I'm not sure how... <sighs> sit down. Sit, 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 sit down. See, um, no time to waste. Please, um, make... <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I, I can't read this. My eyes, you see? Ah. Oh, uh, my copy boy here will translate. Oh, well, I understand. Sign. Let's give your eyes a break for once. Hmm. Uh, how bored thinking of this newspaper to hire a copy boy who no sign. Oh, we're in the middle of a century of progress. Perhaps soon every workplace will have employees who speak sign. However, in this case, it's pure coincidence. His father is deaf, and like many deaf men in the nation's capital, he works downstairs with the printing machines. The infernal racket of the machines doesn't bother them, you see. <laughs> All right, time is fleeting. Let's jump right in. Do you mind if I type while we talk? I've written down some questions for you. Uh, Helen, I expect you'll want to feel my face. <sighs> <sighs> Ah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> How old were you when you realized you wanted to be a teacher of the deaf? Well, I never really wanted to be a teacher. So you don't like teaching? Oh, well, it's not that I don't like it's teaching. It's a burden to you? It's not a burden. It's, it's easy then. Anyone could do it? Easy? I work from dawn to dusk, seven days a week, translating for a, a child. <laughs> My hands are never still. It's exhausting. So you wish you were Helen Keller's teacher. No. You wish you had never met no, her. No, 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 um, you are putting words in my mouth. As you put words in Helen's hands. <laughs> Oh, please translate. Helen, now that you can read and write, what are your plans for the future? In the fall, I will attend the Prudence School for the Blind, where it will be my great pleasure to study literature, languages, and history. And after you graduate? Well, like any girl, I hope to meet the man of my dreams. I wish to return to dearest Alabama, marry, have many, many children, cats, dogs, and uh, a sweet little goat. <laughs> There is no such thing as the man of your dreams. Oh. <laughs> Pardon? Well, and aren't you a writer? I read your letters in the newspaper. They were quite good. Yes, I love to write. They give me such pleasure to express my thoughts to the world. Uh, do you like your typewriter? Do you think I could use one? Of course you can learn to use a typewriter. So tell me more about your views of marriage. Uh, does it hurt your fingers to type? Is it terribly difficult to learn how? Um, may I try out your typewriter? Oh, the dang glass the typewriter. My daughter loves it too. <laughs> Yes, you can try out the typewriter, but under one condition. <laughs> one condition. You must promise not to marry until you have fulfilled your dreams.
Uh, Mrs. Searing, I hardly think that that is appropriate. Um, but, Mrs. Searing, you are married yourself. I'm divorced. Always check your facts, child. And to be a divorcee is a bad thing. My husband dragged me all around the country from post to pole. He nearly destroyed my writing career. And he has left me and my daughter without any money and in quite a difficult situation. And my husband is a good man. I don't understand. Trust your brains, women, not your emotions. But I like boys. I like the way they smell. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, that is always the problem. We all like the way men smell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, all this is very interesting, but hardly newsworthy. Let's get back to the matter at hand. Helen, many have said that you are not very smart and that Anne Sullivan makes up all of your answers. How do you feel about that? Minor, we really must talk about the teacher's color. Absolutely. Chairman Randall! Ah. <laughs> I'm thrilled to see you looking so well. I feel greatly improved. Greatly improved. I don't believe all those rumors you heard about <laughs> me and cancer. <laughs> <laughs> they are balderdash. <laughs> now, I, uh, I hear you have ambitious ideas to share with the committee. God's work is always ambitious. Ah, true. I'd like this meeting to come to order. Now! <laughs> well, President Gallaudet, the supervisory committee has reviewed your projected budget for the coming year. We have uh, recommended in the House of Representatives that they sustain Kendall Green's funding at the current level. We have also voted to recommend an increase in your tuition subsidy and to allow another 10 scholarship students to be admitted to the college. Thank you. Now I will uh, turn the meeting over to President Gallaudet. Thank you, Chairman Randall. At this point, I would like to put forth an idea that I think will excite you all. As you know, over the past 35 years, the National College for Deaf Mutes at Kendall Green has grown enormously. In 1857, we were a school for five desperately poor deaf children, housed in a shack. Today, in 1891, we are an accredited college with a large body of accomplished students. We are an architectural treasure on 96 splendid acres with a view of the capital. The famed architect, Frederick Law Olmsted himself, designed our campus. But now is the time to create, to embrace another challenge. Now is the time to seize the leadership role in deaf education. Now is the time to create a new generation of American educators, American teachers of the deaf. These energetic and forward-thinking young teachers will lift our deaf out of their ignorance and bring them fully into knowledge of their rights and responsibilities in the modern world. Kendall Green has a destiny, a destiny to become a beacon of light for all those unfortunate American children who do not have access to education and thus are denied access to religion, morality, and God's righteousness. Kendall Green can lead the nation, and yes, the world, 
You, ladies and gentlemen, seated at this table, are the angels of that destiny. Your strength and your vision. Ah, uh, the money. <laughs> <laughs> your vision, your vision will go down in history. A teacher's college at Kendall Green, dedicated to the latest teaching methods, the best hygiene, and the highest moral standards will change the world for all the unfortunate deaf throughout this great nation of ours. All in the government dollar, I assume? Well, partly at least. Mr. Fetchheiser, hmm. the parent of one of our brightest students, has contributed generously to the project. But it is not nearly enough. We're certainly hoping the U.S. government can chip in its share. More money. We just voted to increase your subsidy. Kendall Green is part of the public trust. The superiority of our college reflects the superiority of this great nation. This has to stop. The U.S. Congress is not a path pocket, endlessly filled with money to be handed out to whomever asks. I work for the greater good. The education of our youth is vitally important. And God's work is best done by educated minds. I don't have an education. I see the work just fine. You educators are out of touch with real people. Trades, that's what we need to fund. Trades. A self-sustaining trade school for the deaf. In their dependency on handouts. Uh, printing. Woodworking. Metalsmithing. And, oh, I see. Teaching. Teaching is a trade for the deaf. Teaching is a trade. The teacher's college will not admit deaf students. But, no. No, no! The appropriations committee has had enough. I do not Mr. think that chairman. I think you will be pleased, very, very pleased by our plans for the college, our vision for the nation. I think you will be pleased, very, very. Pleased. Public money. Our citizens' money. Public money. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yes, yes
by depression of the soft palate so that the voice can flow through the nose. Like so. <clears throat> to the front of the mouth, but not so close to the gum as E, like so. <clears throat> e, E, now you. E, good, good. You are making progress. Uh, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> So 
friendly, so democratic. Uh, he and Mrs. Harrison read Helen's letters in the newspaper and found them very uplifting. And in this economy, ah, ah, he enclosed a note for you from Mrs. Harrison. It looks like an invitation. Oh, all right. Uh, oh, Mrs. Harrison wants me to drop into the White House on Wednesday. Oh. Oh. She hopes that I will bring Miss Helen any help with me. Oh. 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 But where is my little, lovely little Helen? Oh, the children took her into the office then. Oh, well. No, stop. Helen needs to play to relax, to exercise her imagination. She is a child to put too much pressure on her. But now they have. I don't know how to say this, but Elsie and Daisy feel quite jealous of the time we spend with her. They feel quite neglected. Oh, our daughters, neglected. Oh, by me. Well, I shall go outside right now and tell them how much I love them. I will join in on whatever dainty girl games they are playing. <laughs> Elsie, Daisy, Helen! Oh, Elsie! Helen, get down immediately! Oh! 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 Children, taking you up onto a ladder, onto a rope? What if something had happened to you? Thank you. 
Chairman Radcliffe, it is the opinion of the principals of all the all schools of the country that the teachers' college which President Gallaudet proposes will work injury to the cause of primary schools of this country for the simple reason that deaf teachers cannot teach articulation. Huh. I urge you to oppose any and all legislation funding the teachers' college at Kendall Green. Sincerely, Alexander Graham Bell. Interesting. Very interesting. Several months back, when I read the proposed bill to fund the teachers' college, I completely agreed with Dr. Gallaudet as to the desirability of the establishment of a school of education at Kendall Green. But when I told Dr. Gallaudet that I objected to the wording of the bill, which implied that only deaf students would attend the teachers' college, he refused to change it. Therefore, I and all my colleagues, including Alexander Graham Bell, must oppose this bill. Very respectfully, Zenus Westervelt, Principal, Western New York Institution for Deaf Mutes. It's preposterous. That's an insult. Bell and his rich cronies are trying to destroy my reputation. I'm 
must inform the faculty. My dear boy, I've just heard of the meeting of the Lady Pugdenu that Galileo is accusing you of dishonesty. He told students and faculty at the public assembly that you are spreading untruths about the teachers' college. Me? Galadet's the one who said one thing and lobbied Congress for another. Randall is dead! How inconvenient! <laughs> oh, it's a tragedy. I mean, he was a wonderful statesman. I won't miss him exactly, but oh, that blasted Joseph Cannon is next in line to become chairman of the committee. He's never been a supporter of Kendall Green. Ah, I've been waiting for this. It's time to cut the fat from the appropriation bills. And I'm afraid President Gallaudet and his cronies will be surprised by the pain they will feel. That damn college is a constant drain on the national economy. Mabel, darling, come give me a squeeze. This note is from one of Terry Cannon's aides. I am going to testify against the School of Education at Kendall Green. Errors! Bell has swayed the Senate. They voted in committee to table funding for the Teachers College. Hellfire and damnation! I can't let Bell win. My father said, son, teach the deaf to speak. My father said, dear, show the world your strength. My father said, son, honor your mother with song. And even me, speech is the great, speech is the spider. We all have an obligation to help and understand each other. Like my father, I love the sound of speech. How it rumbles in the throat, twists around the tongue, and pushes past the lips. Speech, it delights me. Like my father. I value reputation, guard my social station. Don't call me deaf and dumb, but hear me shout out loud. I'm a woman with pride. Like my father, my love's lovely lord. On a deaf child's place, when he learns his very heart, how the language of the road, he taught my honor. My mother taught me the glory of words, and I would die if his blood was in vain. My father needs my loyalty. And I would die if his work was in vain. My father taught me oh, the path my mother to sign. I would die I if, would his die work if his work was in vain. My father needs my Lord a legacy. And I would die I if would his work was in vain. 
Eliza has been quite deaf since we were both children. But Freddie will be her ears and her voice today. Oh, delighted, I'm sure. And may I introduce Miss Anne Sullivan and Miss Helen Keller. What a fool I here. Oh, we should all have tea. My dear Helen, I understand that you're learning speech. Can you say something to me? Um, well, she has nothing to be about to you. actually. Oh, um, Mrs. Harrison, do you mind if Helen feels your face so she can see you? I would be insulted if she did not. <laughs> 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 Ma'am, are you ill? I have been unable to shake this cough since we moved into the warehouse. Why they built this house in the swamps of Falky Bottom, I just don't know. Still, the new sewers that the district commission has installed should soon help dry things up a bit. Should help with the rats and the mice, too. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Harrison, your face has such strength, such character. Some feel a woman should be gentle and yielding and not have a thought in her head. Luckily, President Harrison likes a woman with spunk. And I am certainly that. <laughs> Why, just yesterday, the trustees at Johns Hopkins University came to me to see if I would help raise money for their new medical college. Well, said I, only if you will allow women to become medical students. Really? <laughs> Oh, uh, um, women can go to college? I did, and I hope that you will. Well, how can I go to college? I am deaf and blind. <laughs> That's just logistics. Just, just logistics? logistics? Come now, ladies, let's not discourage Helen. We must look to the new generation. There is progress in the world around us as we leave a century behind. We, as women educated, are learning to lift mankind. The distaffs are praised, learning as we only falls. With minds grown strong and righteous, we storm the academy sound holes. With our day frocks starched and ruffled, and our long hair brushed and brushed, we as women educated are learning to save the world. Raise the staff of higher learning. Of needless man, as scientists, writers, and physicians, we'll finish what our sisters began. Our silence is not compliance, and our sweetness is not weak. We, as women, have knowledge, no wisdom when we speak. With our day books, starch, and ruffles, and our long hair brushed and curled, we, as women educated, are learning to save the world. With our day books, starch, and ruffles, and our long hair brushed and curled, we, as women educated, of a modern age and any modern woman needs education, even a writer. 
Mm. Oh, Helen, imagine what a first class educator could do for you. A college degree for me. Yes. Oh, Helen, I understand that you love dogs. Come outside with me to see my little Missy. Her puppies are so dogs. <laughs> A college degree for her. Well, what about me? Step forward, Dr. Bell. Honored gentlemen of the Appropriations Committee, I have daily, hourly experience of the value of teaching the deaf to speak and to lip read in my own home. My dear wife, Mabel Hubbard Bell, easily passes for hearing amongst the highest levels of Washington society because of her adeptness and articulation and lip reading. And I was her teacher. And my heart pleads for the speaking young men at the National College who are placed under deaf teachers with deaf companions. Their speech will wither away, leaving them trapped in a deaf world. Therefore, I urge you to kill this bill in committee. The citizens of this great nation should not fund a major step backwards in deaf education. Thank you, honored gentlemen. Before we move on, I would like to recognize that Carrie Harrison, the First Lady of the United States, has just entered the house. Welcome, dear lady. <laughs> President Gallinet, would you like to make your rebuttal now? Honored members of the committee, I find I am a good deal aggrieved. It is a pitiful spectacle to see a man of natural, generous impulses, such as Dr. Bell, given over to partisan spite. Bell's statements to you are full of garbled statements and misrepresentations. She, President Gallaudet, she! Come to order! Come to order! Hear me! I firmly believe that every deaf student who can should learn to speak. At Kendall Green, we do teach both sign language and articulation. That's not what I hear. Nothing but wag of hands at that school. Furthermore, at our Teachers College, only hearing students will be admitted. We will train only those who can hear to teach the deaf. No! No! You can't do this. I must train as a teacher. It's my dream. Dallas had clearly told this lad that he could attend the teacher's college. Order, I say! Order! But as a point of clarification, President Gallaudet, I'm sure Chairman Randall told me the purpose of the teacher's college was to supply the deaf with a trade. Sir, there seems to be a misunderstanding. I think not. Well, no deaf students will be admitted to the teacher's college. No. <laughs> The only misunderstanding was that I trusted you. Are you saying, President Gallaudet, that no deaf student at the National College for the Deaf will become a teacher of the deaf? Sir, you twist my words. I move for a vote on this matter. All in favor of putting the bill to fund the Teachers College in front of the full House of Representatives, vote aye. All against putting the bill to fund the Teachers College in front of the full House of Representatives, vote nay. <laughs> the nays have it. The motion fails. Thank you all. Fellows, and you misunderstood 
me back there. It's all politics, only politics. Nothing against you, it's not personal. What's oh, that? The bad and quit your boy. I know exactly how you feel. These hairy men and their great schemes for us. And, oh. What did you say? I didn't understand you. What did you say? I didn't understand you. Oh, oh, my, my. What a pickle. Oh, <laughs> so, me, Motari, may I introduce you to Representative Joseph Cannon from Illinois and his lovely wife. Mr. Cannon has just become chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. I'm so sorry to hear of Mr. Randall's passing. It's such a sad time. Alec and I will miss the chair. Mm, no. My wife, me. I'm delighted. What a pleasure. Oh, now I hear you have a beautiful new car. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty. President Gallup, yes. I agree you should come one by us. Pardon? You got your school of education funded after all. My understanding is that you slipped funding for the teacher's college right by us. It was in your request for articulation of the <coughs> what? You oh. misunderstand. I will use that money solely to pay teachers of articulation at the college. Faculty who will teach at the teacher's college. True. And also teach all of the other subjects at the teacher's college. Uh, yes. And here is our brilliant first student. <laughs> Looks like we lost this round. Too bad, old chap. <coughs> <coughs> If we could all come to order, I would like to begin our evening's investigation. Thank you all for coming tonight. I think you know what pleasure it brings me to hold these weekly scientific meetings for the members of the Geographic Society and our friends. As you will see when you peruse the latest edition of Science. Our little investigations and conversations here seem to spark the most fantastic developments. <laughs> ah, well, tonight's subject is deaf education. Now, there are many methods of deaf communication, uh, some taught at the private institutions across the nation, and some at the subsidized public college here in the nation's capital. Although we advocates of deaf education do not always agree, there is no argument that great strides have been made during this amazing century in the various methods of deaf communication. One product of these advances is the subject of today's investigation. As a demonstration, Miss Helen Keller has kindly agreed to let us quiz her today on the subject of geography. I will begin. My dear Miss Keller, did the Greeks believe the earth to be flat or spherical in shape? First, let me say what an honor it is to be here tonight among the brightest stars of the District of Columbia scientific minds. How warmly the glow of your spirits lights the room. How delightful your questioning souls. In the year 240 BC, the Greek astronomer 
Eratosthenes of Alexandria used a shadow stick to prove that the Earth was round. He also developed the system of latitude and longitude. Oh, yes. President Gallagher, please proceed. My dear Miss Keller, on which continent does the Ottoman Empire lie? Like its capital, Constantinople, which sits in both Europe and its cousin Asia, the Ottoman Empire stretches from ancient Anatolia to the far desert of Asia. Miss Keller, what is the genus and species of penguin that inhabits the North Pole? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Cannon, there are no penguins at the North Pole. They live at the South Pole. I believe you are thinking of the tufted puppets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and now, Helen has prepared a wonderful surprise for us. I will not ruin it, but simply let her, shall we say, speak for herself. Proceed, Helen. I will now recite an excerpt from A Song of Life, written by Henry Wadsworth. Longfellow. Tell me not in mournful numbers. Life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real. Life is earnest, and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art, to dust returnest. Was not spoken of the soul. Congratulations, old man. Wonderful. Helen's speech gladdened my heart. Yes. Thank you. She's a treasure. She's one child in a million. Her intellectual capability is far superior to that of an ordinary child. I always knew that. I didn't really play fair. I could never teach any other child to speak in ten days. It just can't be done. Well, the button 
The game is not always fair, and you did it this once. You taught a deaf blind girl to speak. Amazing. Communication is such a wonderful thing. In all of its ways. All of its ways. Old oh, man, I am sorry for our misunderstandings of the last piece. I may have been hasty in my judgment of you two. And my passions may have made me lose my head. Nettles, <laughs> I am glad that you will get trained as a teacher. This fight was never about you. To you and I, perhaps, to Annals, it was painfully so. Yes. Dr. Bell. I've been thinking. Uh, yes, my dear. I want to become a great man. I want to leave footprints on the sands of time. You want to be a, a great man? Why not a, a great lady? Well, I want future generations to remember me, and not just as a deaf and blind girl. Well, I think you can be fantastic, amazing, a, a, a great writer, a world leader, perhaps even a pirate someday. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My, <laughs> like there's a circus back there. My name is Carrie, and I'm an acting company member here with WSC Avant Garde. This is my partner in crime, Adam, and he is pretty much the best. for joining us for this world premiere musical. We feel very privileged to bring it to you with our friends here at Gallaudet University. Before you head out today, bye guys. <laughs> uh, we wanted to just take two more minutes before the after chat begins to let you know what else is going on this season. Last weekend, we opened a play called There is a Happiness That Morning Is at our resident theater called Theater on the Run in Arlington, Virginia. We had the opportunity to present that as part of last year's DC Fringe Festival, and we're excited to bring it back to a wider audience. This December, Avant Garde turns 25, and we're celebrating our anniversary by bringing you that timeless holiday classic, a Klingon Christmas Carol. <laughs> That's right, the language of Star Trek. This February, we're teaming up with Lean and Hungry Theater to present Shakespeare's Othello, and we close our season with a brand new translation of the Mad Woman of Shio. It's French, it's down and dirty, it is everything that Avant Garde loves about theater. We hope that you'll be able to join us for one of these other productions this year. Now, we are a small nonprofit theater company and we rely on the kindness of strangers. <laughs> As you exit the theater, either before the after chat or if you choose to stick around, there will be two beautiful actors begging at the door. <laughs> Those of you joining us through our HowlRound live stream, you're also welcome to make a donation through our website at avantgarde.org. That's right, everybody. If you have anything else that you can possibly give. Ladies, if your coin pout purses are, are bursting at the zipper seams. <laughs> Gentlemen, if your money bags are weighing down in your pockets. <laughs> we will accept whatever you can possibly give. We'll take your pocket lint your paper clips, your pennies, nickels, singles, twenties, personal checks. We cannot at this time accept credit cards, except for online, but in person we are working on it. We hope that you will stick around for our after chat today. They've been exceptional discussions. And if you don't, we hope to see you in the future. Please stay warm and have a wonderful holiday season. Thank you.
Sorry, folks, we're just working out some logistics here. Thank you all so much for uh, coming to the show and for staying afterwards. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, a couple of very special guests. First of all, Mary Reesing, playwright. And Meredith Peruzzi, who is a, a historian. Uh, she's the curator of an exhibit here on campus right now. Uh, she helped us with some of the historical research and wrote a wonderful blog post about uh, the, some of the history behind this uh, play. Uh, I usually turn it over to Meredith first in these post show discussions, but actually I'd like to start with uh, Mary Reesing. And oh, actually, first, let, let's go around and let's introduce ourselves uh, over here. Uh, starting over here with Brady. Brady? Hi, I play Beetle. My actual name is Brady. I play May. My name is Tiger Street. I play Jacob, and my name is Jose. Thank you for coming. I'm Sam. I, I played Enel. I'm Aaron. Uh, hi, I'm Aaron. I'm Tom Baldridge. I play Meyer, President Gallaudet, and I'm on the faculty here at Gallaudet. Hi, I'm Miranda. I play Helen Keller, and I'm a graduate student here at Gallaudet. I'm Adam Bartley, interpreter here at Gallaudet, and my first time joining this crazy group in a <laughs> <laughs> And I'm Tom Pruitt, I'm the artistic director of WSC Avant Guard and also the director of today's show. Okay, uh, I started to ask, Mary Reese, can yeah. you talk to us a little bit about how you got started writing this piece? Um, well, the, the short story is uh, I was commissioned to write this piece by a theater company called Open Circle uh, that specialized in doing musicals that combine cast of deaf and hearing actors. Um, and so I I worked with them for about two years on this play. I, Tom directed all the all the developmental sites. So that's that's the simple question, the simple way I, I um, started writing the play. And I, I've been thinking a lot because I've been asked a lot about you know, how, how did I write the characters, where did they come from? And I really realized that a lot of Part of this play for me came from my experience uh, working as a Fulbright scholar in Armenia, um, where I took a whole family. And um, it, a lot of the play, I, as I watched it, I said, oh yeah, yeah, that's about like, how we, we struggled to communicate um, when we were in Armenia, and how the Armenians who speak a language that only about two million people were struggling to communicate with the outside world. Um, so that, that's sort of that, that's sort of where the emotional part of this, this uh, play came for me. Uh, also, I did tons and tons of research. And a lot of what you hear on stage from the actors in terms of the actual words uh, that the, the historical characters spoke here as well. Can you cite a couple of examples of that? Um, uh, Helen Keller's song, Here There Is Touch. There's quivering is actually from a poem that Helen Keller wrote. Not the whole thing. I stole bits and pieces, but a lot of the language and certainly most of the ideas were coming from Helen Keller's own writings and particular experiments. So that poem. Um, almost all the things that uh, Gallaudet and uh, Bell spoke in public came from their actual public speaking. Great. Uh, Meredith, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, what you learned when you researched about this play and the historical background on this play? Yes, yeah, so really, actually, the play is pretty historically accurate to some degree. What you see here is really a combining of actually 
several years as opposed to two weeks where the play would take place. It's for the purpose of the audience to understand what's happening in a shorter time span, but was done so appropriately. There were some modifications made for um, artistic purposes. For example, the communication style for Helen Keller. She actually didn't use rhymes. She used fingerspelling in her hands. But for the purpose of the audience, to have them be able to understand, we use signs. Plus, we use the hand placement down so that the signs would be more clear to the audience. And old character as well uh, was a mix of different people. Real people, yes. <coughs> Adam was a real person. He was African American student here, and he was actually the second African American student here, but he was graduate. So that character is a mix of several different students who went through that same experience. And so that was all we did within his character. Do you want to talk about the cartoon? Oh, yes, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> So maybe when you were watching the play, you noticed we have these two character characters in the back. You may be wondering why they did their box. <coughs> this actually happened in Washington, D.C. There was a newspaper, of course, theater, and they were aware of the debate that was going to happen between uh, Gallaudet and Bell on Capitol Hill. So they were in a political cartoon, and you'll see Bell on the right and Minor on the left. And that was actually taken from a contemporary cartoon and put into the set. The set uh, was, as you know from the program, was designed by Ethan Sennett, who was the chair of the Department of the Theater and Dance Program here at Gallaudet. And it is, uh, is he over there? Is he hiding? Is he? <laughs> there he is. Ethan has been my partner in crime in this whole project. Uh, we have worked very closely together, and I can't tell him how thankful I am, how grateful I am to this, this uh, program uh, for this opportunity and for making this possible. Again, I'll look forward. You heard Carrie's speech after the show about how poor we are and how small we are. It's all true. And so, <laughs> uh, and so uh, it would not have been possible if we hadn't been able to team up and work together uh, on this project. So, thank you, Ethan. You're more than welcome. Thank you to Avant Garde for bringing this idea to us a long time ago. It was a year ago. It's hard to believe that we've been working on this project for a year, and here it is coming to fruition. So, congratulations. Uh, I, I meant to mention uh, that the this whole Howl Round live stream broadcast and this discussion is being captioned by the National Captioning Institute. So it's been streaming captioning this whole time. Uh, and they've asked me, when you have questions uh, or comments, for me to repeat them so that people can hear it on the camera and so forth. So uh, I'd like to turn it over to you all. We call them unscripted after chats. That's exactly what they are. Totally, totally unscripted. Uh, so ask whatever you would like. Yes, sir. Yes. I feel very much at a disadvantage because I don't sign. But I want to say that this was the most effective production. The blocking was very clever. The music was lovely. And you were all so committed to your parts. It was a joy. And Aaron, Aaron, you are a dancer, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, and if I can respond to that, um, I did grow up in dance, and I was involved in step, and I've always been involved with music, and that's been a part of me um, since I was 14 years old. So now 15 years involved in music. So thanks for the comment. <laughs> uh, yes, back here. I'm curious about Aidan Bell's involvement with the conference in Milan. Was he influential there? The question was about A.D. Bell's uh, involvement in the conference, the famous conference in Milan. Was he was he influential? influential? Meredith? Meredith? <laughs> he actually didn't go to the conference. Um, there were plenty of orbits there instead. Um, there was only one Dutch American there, and it really was 
Well, Bell didn't need to go. There were plenty of orders there. Yeah. Yes. Um, my son, who is 15, is um, starting to take ASL for the first time, and I wondered if there's some sort of immersion program or something like that that you all might have for the summer for a child. The question is, is there an immersion program for ASL here at Gallaudet University? Uh, what's that? Um, after high school graduation, students can come as part of a Jump Start program, and there they offer a four week or five week intensive ASL courses. They have peer coaches and peer mentors to help learn what Gallaudet looks like, and also to teach um, the ACs of American Sign Language. So, if that's a good start for you, it's right before the fall semester starts. Get a feel of campus, and then by mid semester, they're really ready to go. I have a quick question though. Um, for the high school student, you want to know if there's an immersion program for that? For your son? Yeah. Okay, so we do have immersion programs like that. I'm not uh, completely sure. Uh, Tom, you may know. There is a two week summer camp that we are open to students that are learning ASL. We have intensive study during that time for hearing students that are learning ASL. And it's traditionally done only. Thanks. I was wondering about the uh, historical accuracy of the scene towards the end where Helen Keller is uh, giving her presentation to the, um, the National Geographic Society and how that was uh, received, what the historical record says about how that, how that went. So, so the question was about the final scene, really, of the play at, at the uh, meeting of the National Geographic Society, and uh, whether that actually took place, and how Helen Keller's was uh, recitation was uh, was received. Um, well, first I should say that that, that scene is pretty much made up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's very well received, right? Yeah. <laughs>
Tom and Miranda, but just generally for anybody in the cast who played a historical figure, what kind of research did you do to play those roles, to play Gallaudet, to play Helen Keller, and to play, you know, the first lady? What kind of research did it take to portray these famous characters, these historical characters? Thank you. There is a book written about this uh, debate between Bell and uh, Gallaudet. Just like me. Uh, so I read that book. Uh, I read that book, and it gave me a great insight into uh, Gallaudet's uh, aspirations. Uh, that he first wanted to be involved in business. He wanted to become rich. Uh, tried that out. Found, found it wasn't a good fit. His mother was deaf. He'd grown up in a deaf school that his father had founded, and he found that that was his niche. And as a young man took over the school here, and within seven years had managed to make it into a college, and within a few years after that had the funds for these magnificent buildings. And so he's a very self-confident, very ambitious man, uh, but also a firm believer in his, his philosophy of, of education and what he wanted to provide to the deaf community. Also that he did support speech among deaf people, if they could but not to the exclusion of learning other things through sign language. Um, there are actually a lot of books that were about Helen Keller, but it was her later in life. And so I was trying to focus on her childhood before she turned 13. So there wasn't a lot of research out there. Um, people grow so much in those formative years, but I wanted to make sure to include that in my character. Uh, Helen Keller met, met Anne Sullivan uh, when she was seven. So I really focused on this time period of seven to 13 and how it was raw. It was still very early, very emotional. Um, she could behave herself in public, but any way that she could still kind of cause that mischief, she wanted to take advantage of the opportunities that were out there. For example, the typewriter was to do that stopping his feet, um, knowing that it bothered other people, but making this noise. So she was trying to be polite, but take advantage of what she could at the same time. So I had to find that happy moment of politeness and that was fun in there too. So I just sort of made up my own happy color. <laughs> and um, I played Annie Sullivan, which was a great joy for me. Um, I had a lot of people recommend to me when I told them that I was playing this role uh, that I watched The Miracle Worker, any of the nomad themes. And I did not do that uh, purposefully uh, because I wanted to um, derive the character from the direct source material, which I consider to be uh, Helen Keller's autobiography, um, as well as the book, uh, which I think focuses on a very um, a fascinating, very liminal time in Anne Sullivan's life, uh, where she does not realize that she is, in fact, going to be um, a part of Helen Keller's life for the rest of her life and how much, how greatly influential that's going to be. So um, as far as my research, I talked to Mary quite a bit about uh, this period of Anne's life, and um, I read parts of Helen Keller's autobiography, which is beautiful. Um, and the most striking part of the book that I read that really influenced my performance is um, when a chapter in which Helen describes um, an incident where after young and young, still young in her childhood when Anne Sullivan tells her, I love you. She spells out into Helen Keller's hand, I love you. And Helen does not understand, she does not comprehend what that phrase means. And it takes more months for for her to understand. And it, it, that knowing that Anne Sullivan loved Helen Keller as a child, as her own child, in a way, was hugely influential to my understanding of their relationship. Anybody else? No? Okay. Next question or comment? Okay, well, yes. I, I was curious how you uh, worked to recreate the old style of sign language and how you made the decision that Mrs. Bell would have a very clear articulation. Um, there, there was a, uh, a gentleman, there is a gentleman named Aaron Hubie who served as the director of artistic sign language 
for this production. Uh, meaning, it was his responsibility, I'm sorry he's not here, it was his job <laughs> to make sure that the, uh, that the signing kind of, in, in, in uh, Miranda's words, split the, hit that, split the difference between what it would have been authentically in the 1890s, and of course languages change and grow and evolve over time. So some of those signs are no longer done the same way. They're not, it's, it's not the same language anymore. So it was his job really to split the difference between then and now so that the audience could appreciate it and follow along. But at the same time, have that sort of uh, slightly uh, antique quality to it at various, various times. So I'm sorry, he's not here to address that question as far as uh, Mabel Bell. And would you like to talk about her? Sure, sure, I can. So um, Mabel had speech before illness. Um, in her death when she was five years old. And in the research for the play and then in conversations with the production team, we, uh, we discovered that there was no clear evidence that she spoke with what could be considered like a deaf accent. Um, history says that she has a bit of a weird tone to her voice, but you don't want to interpret that in a way that could particularly be offensive. So for the purpose of this play and knowing that through lip reading, she could be um, understood in society. We chose, uh, we elected to have her, me, I spoke clearly. Um, and that was an artistic choice. And so um, it could really go either way. I don't know if there's anything that you would like to follow up with or, no. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things was, uh, she's from Boston, and so we, one of the things we struggle with and that we talked a lot about is did she have a Boston accent? <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, and it was and, and similarly, oh there it is. Uh, we discussed whether or not Bell had a Scottish accent because he's Scottish, but then his parents taught his father taught elocution. Uh, so it was, it was like what what was his ang and he grew up partly in Canada. So what was what was his accent? And it, it, it was it was a mix of stuff. It was really interesting. But whenever you do a play, this play or any yeah. other, play, <laughs> you really don't want the accent to get in the way of telling the story. And so that's this is where we were at. <laughs> and, and there was just from speaking as a director, uh, the, the uh, there was a lot. There is a lot going on in this play. Uh, that has to do with different modes of communication, different styles of communication, to layer onto that too thick an accent for any one character would, you know, kind of muddy it uh, a little bit, I think, I think. Um, and uh, so we, as, as, as people were saying, we, we made the choice, conscious choice, to not go that route to let the, the different forms of communication that are already in evidence on the stage uh, speak for themselves. Yeah, yeah, one instance of that was um, when Laura Redden's hearing, uh, in the scene with Laura Redden's hearing, where Laura Redden's hearing actually liked to write back and forth. Do you want to talk about I don't know why he writes. Yeah, he's I, I think I I think she she wrote because she was at, she was a journalist and she was interviewing a lot of people who weren't mm -hmm. deaf. Yeah, and then often initially deaf and also I'm wondering if maybe her signing she was like, I don't know. Like if she didn't know enough. Uh, there weren't perhaps enough people who she was interacting with who could find that. Yeah, probably. Yeah, but anyway, in the in the scene, we tried it at some point with her just writing back and forth, and it became so complicated to do on stage um, that we cheated. <laughs> <laughs> and what, even with the cheating, uh, it, 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 it resulted in what what to me is one of the kind of. Uh, I don't know, but the most notable scenes in the play kind of capsulizes uh, the, uh, the, the 
struggle to communicate where you have one character over here typing away and then handing off notes, written notes to somebody who voices it and somebody else who's signing. And so, so in that one little scene, uh, you have kind of the, in a nutshell, really what the whole play is really about. I think it's really, really bright. Uh, let's see. I, I think I had somebody up here, and then I'll come back to you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Up here. Hi, again. Um, I'm fascinated with Miranda's portrayal of Helen Keller. Are you yourself visually impaired? Uh, you can have a deaf line consulting the play. I thought it was very um, accurately portrayed. Um, actually, Aaron, uh, our coach, Aaron Peavy, um, is also a counselor for the blind. And so he works at the CBI as well. So he consulted with us in terms of that, figuring out what the visual impairment would look like and what would happen back then how deaf people, deaf blind people are more sensitive to touch, for example, and how we can use our other senses. So that's really how I learned with some hair and sight. And I'm not right. <laughs> 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 yes, I'm curious why you chose to turn this play into a musical. Uh, because it was commissioned as I was commissioned to write a musical. I was commissioned to write a musical, so I wrote a musical. That's how it <laughs> Specifically, there was a there is a theater company called Open Circle Theater Company Theater that uh, does uh, generally very large cast plays, and I believe it was still a bit. Uh, Susie Richard, who was here last night, I saw the show last night, uh, that she basically said to you, "Write me a large cast musical with a lot of roles for deaf actors." Yeah, and, and I think the thing that I did differently from what they had done in the past is what they had is they would double cast. So every every role was played by a hearing actor and a deaf actor. And for better or worse, and to just make Tom pull his hair out, I, I decided to throw that away, to, to, to have each each character be their own and you know each character just be their character. And if they, they spoke, they spoke. If they signed, they signed. Um, and, and see how that works on stage. Um, and I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Uh, yes, ma'am. Will the play, will the production be done in other cities, possibly? Well, we certainly hope so. Uh, I'll tell you, one of the, one of the, um, the goals, my goals, in accepting this project and, and embracing this project, really, and, and wanting to do it so badly here in the District of Columbia, where all the events took place, uh, was partly to prove to producers around the country that this play can, first of all, and should be done, uh, to make it, you know, to and, and this is certainly the HowlRound uh, tele uh, live stream broadcast, hopefully will spread the word, it will be visual proof that it once was done, <laughs> and not by a huge theater, uh, but by a theater company that was willing to take chances, by a really outstanding theater department that is also willing to take chances, and uh, that working together, we made it happen. Uh, and working together, obviously, with an incredible artistic and production team, uh, including these wonderful actors. So I really, really hope, I do think it should be done in every city in the country, uh, and uh, I hope it will be. Um, just, just to go back for a second to the question about musical, I, I didn't mean. I, I mean, I, that was the literal truth. But the the other the other truth is that I'm a strong believer in heightened moments on stage, moments when um, productions step away from realism. And I was really, really interested in uh, the the sort of the, the sign and deaf equivalent of the musical theater moment. Um, and I was, I had seen in other productions moments where deaf actors were able to create these wonderful, wonderful sort of musical moments that were, yes, silent, but also very, very um, rhythmic and just sort of beautiful in, a, in the same way that musical theater moments are. And so that's what I was looking for in this was, um, Sort of, I, I wanted it to be sort of equal 
I wanted heightened moments for ASL moments, um, uh, deaf communication moments, and that, that's, that's what it was. So it's, yes, it's a musical, but it's also, I don't know, I don't know how, how to describe um, what my collaborators did. It's like fantastic heightened theatricality. We have time for one or two more. Oh, I see some of you. Oh, sorry, sorry. Can I actually um, ask that? Yes. Um, if the play would tour or where it should be held, um, we do have to remember that everything, most of what you saw had happened, and not only on Capitol Hill, but right here. It was on campus, Gallaudet University, the lecture happened in Chapel Hall, which is here on campus in DC City. You can go and stand where Alexander Graham Bell stood. The museum is there now. So um, Minor Gallaudet actually lectured there as well. Helen Keller came to campus. So everything actually happened right here. <laughs> so it could have happened, uh, this play could have taken place anywhere in DC, but it didn't. Most of the collaboration with Gallaudet Theater and Dan's company meant it happened right here on campus. So that's a pretty cool concept. <laughs> Alisa, who was our uh, head 
musician. She played piano for years, so I worked with her, sat with her a lot, listened to the music over and over again. Um, with the song Give Me a Sign, um, I couldn't sing at all. So we just had to follow the rhythm and be able to get involved with that. So we felt the rhythm. And that was a challenge, of course, um, because even though I was able to guide them a little bit in the musical aspect, um, we had to make sure that we weren't off beat. And really that goal, I want communication, I was also sort of believing that as well. And with Helen Keller too, um, just taking the opportunity to sign without singing, but still being involved in that musical pro process. It took a lot of practice, but I felt like we were able to combine these aspects of the musical to create a wonderful story. Um, I wanted to add to, I didn't sing, of course, but I did speak the poem, and I had never learned to speak at all. I've never been involved in speech therapy. This was the first time that I approached this. And Aaron, who is the director of Artistic ASL, also knows how to speak, so he taught me few lessons and it was really tough because of course um, I didn't know how to use this tonality, I didn't know how to use my breath, my throat would hurt when I was trying to practice as a deaf person. Um, I didn't really want to learn to speak because I was deaf. So that was the thing that I needed. So how could I? Um, people expect us to speak. How could they expect us to speak if we can't hear? So it's something that I strongly disagree with. And I feel as a deaf person, as my identity, I need to be aware of that. But I also had to understand where Helen Keller was coming from and what history told us that she could speak and that uh, kind of fitting my identity with her by coming up with this character in um, <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> I'd like to add one thing. There's a song where, that Helen signs, and there are two female singers. And she's perfectly in sync with the, the words that she can't hear because of the lighting cues that she memorized to keep parallel with the, the song of voices. I think I thought that was very impressive. And, and I will add to that 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 uh, I think all of us remember uh, the rehearsal where um, the first time we actually ran through that National Geographic Society meeting scene and where Randy took the plunge. And it was an amazing act of courage uh, for this young actress uh, to, to go ahead and, and to give it her all, to try to speak. Uh, and it was incredibly moving, as I'm, I'm sure you felt in, in performance, but it was certainly very, very moving and one of the most remarkable accomplishments I've ever had the, the privilege of being involved in. So, um, and really, I think that goes for this entire cast. I think that is a really remarkable accomplishment uh, from my point of view uh, to work together to learn not only to communicate here on stage, but also backstage and when they're sitting in the theater waiting for their turn to rehearse. And uh, when we were building the lighting cues, cue after cue, so that people could know where we were in the song and so forth. It has been a remarkable um, journey for all of us. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing it. Uh, I want to say uh, happy birthday, Gallaudet University. They're 150 years old this year. And happy birthday, happy birthday to the University of Ontario. We are 25. <laughs> Thank you.